Okay, so the meeting now is live on YouTube. So, okay, um, I'm going to start now. Is that okay, Professor Nanda Kumar? Can you hear me, Professor Nanda Kumar? Yeah, okay, Shankar is here. Yeah, so I'm going to start the um, start the colloquium. So <clears throat> I welcome all of you for this edition of the NSF Wednesday Colloquium. Um, and uh, it's right exactly at 4, 4 p.m. And um, we have our uh, speaker actually right here physically uh, going to give the colloquium. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Krishna Swami Nandakumar, who is the Gordon A. and Mary Kane Endowed, Endowed Chair Professor from Louisiana State University. So um, he's actually spending some time at TIFR with uh, Professor Shankar Ghosh. Um, so we are absolutely thrilled that uh, he's here to give the colloquium physically. Uh, just for those who actually are joining the NSF Wednesday Colloquium for the first time, uh, I just wanted to remind you that the colloquium series is as old as TIFR and it was conceived by um, uh, Professor Homi Bhaba, our founding director. Uh, who thought that it would be very, um, very nice if um, yeah, like all the faculty members and the um, um, the faculty members um, and the students uh, of the National Sciences faculty could get together uh, once um, on a Wednesday at 4 p.m. and get to hear from leading experts from around the world about contemporary issues in uh, physics, chemistry, and biology. So today is no different. Um, we have Professor Nanda Kumar. Uh, to introduce formally, Professor Nanda Kumar is um, uh, Professor Shankar Ghosh from uh, the uh, from the Department of uh, Condensed Matter Physics and Material Science at TIFR. Shankar, uh, it's uh, over to you. Please introduce uh, Professor Nanda. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Kumar. Who... Hello. Yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Kumar, whom I've known and collaborated for some time now. Uh, Professor Kumar did his uh, PhD at Princeton, but in general, though he's a chemical engineer, his interests are very varied. So he works on a large number of problems, collaborates both with experimentalists and industry. And so we hope that we'll get a new perspective about uh, chemical engineering, its, its uh, development over ages and its connection with the industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shankar. Can, can you hear me? It's okay. Uh, I really want to thank uh, TAFR for this opportunity to come and spend uh, three months and uh, thank the Government of India, SERB, for the Vajra Fellowship that enabled uh, my visit. As uh, Professor Ghosh suggested, uh, I mean, indicated earlier, uh, we have been collaborating for the last four or five years, and uh, Professor Joshi introduced uh, me to Professor Shankar's work. And I've been here for about uh, 10 days, and it has been an absolute delight talking to him, visiting his lab, interacting with his students. And uh, I'm sure that I will learn a lot in the next three months. Uh, I'm an engineer, uh, a chemical engineer at that. So uh, what I have to say may be heavily weighted on the applied side. Uh, I try to learn the fundamentals to the extent that I need to make the applications as rigorous as possible. So we wrote uh, with Professor Joshi um, and a few other colleagues, uh, an article, a perspective article for a new journal by the American uh, Chemical Society. Uh, it's called ACS Engineering AU. And uh, the editor invited us to uh, provide a perspective on opportunities for innovation in uh, chemical manufacturing industries. So we took that opportunity and wrote that article. And this talk is essentially kind of based on what we have learned while putting that article together. Uh, I will also take uh, some material from one of my favorite books called The Singularity is Near to impress upon the point that the rate of growth of technology has been accelerating uh, tremendously, and he makes a point very well. So I will draw some of those results. But let me just uh, address what do chemical engineers do? 
So this talk is going to be in three parts. The first part, I'm going to give you an idea for those non-chemical engineers, what is chemical engineering, what do we do, and how do we do it, and why it is so important. And then a second part that focuses on the role of computers in society today. Okay, so uh, they're becoming very, very powerful and uh, all pervasive. So I spent some time drawing on the computer advances in the computational technologies. And I saw just uh, outside that there is a talk next week on AI in uh, chemistry, I believe. So it is affecting every field, what is happening in the computer area. How can we use that for creating manufacturing innovations in the chemical industry? And the last week we had from BASF, the director, and I attended that lecture. So uh, I will try to tie some of our uh, thinking to that. So chemical engineers essentially start at this point where we have fossil fuel and we have the biofuel, biofeedstocks, and energy, nuclear energy, solar energy, or the energy from fossil fuel, chemicals as well from the fossil fuels. And we work on the intermediate stage that you see, and that is the conversion technologies. So at the end of it, I want you to be able to go and tell your mother that she is a chemical engineer, because what does your mother do in the kitchen? Or if you are a cook, what do you do in the kitchen? Is exactly the same as what chemical engineers do, except in large scale very 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 large scale okay what do we what do chemical engineers do we pull apart molecules that are together in a mixture that's a separation part and we mix molecules that are separated okay that's the mixing process so we separate we mix and we react we convert one molecule into the other molecule these are the three things that chemical engineers do using a variety of equipment, but in large scale. All these three things occur in the kitchen as well. We use pressure and temperature as our operating conditions to achieve the desired goal of separation or mixing or conversion. And we produce products that you see at the top of the line to sustain ourselves in our evolutionary path. These could be pharmaceuticals, agricultural products, etc. So. Uh, this is a figure that appeared in that particular article of ACS that my daughter drew when she was in eighth grade. She's now grown up, but somehow when they asked for a picture, this resonated with me, basically captures how physics evolves to chemistry, evolves to biology. This is a theme that also is addressed by the book, uh, uh, Raymond uh, Kurzweil on Singularity is Near. So, what was there in her mind to draw that? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> it captures evolution <laughs> in a very intuitive way. <laughs> um, so the first part is going to, as I said, talk about chemical engineering itself, an introduction, a history. And the second part about computers, about which I'm quite passionate, uh, even though I'm not a computer scientist. And the third one is I'm going to give you a few examples of how innovations can occur. And I will conclude the talk with a list of 10 different topics that we have worked on, but I'm just taking two samples to tell you how innovation in chemical engineering might look like. So this is uh, chemical engineering by numbers. Okay, in the US, there are over 10,000 chemical companies. There are over 70,000 products that are produced. It's close to a trillion dollar business employing close to a million people directly. And 20% of the patents are in the chemical industry space dealing with chemicals. And uh, this is to show you the fastest growth rate in all aspects of technology. But this data is coming from uh, uh, discovery of new molecules. Every 2.6 seconds, a new molecule is synthesized or discovered. By the time I finish the sentence, there are probably three or four new molecules that we didn't know about before, right? That is the pace at which we are discovering new molecules. And uh, the chemical abstract, uh, the, uh, the catalog, 182 million known chemicals. And another data is it took 33 years to catalog the first 10 million chemicals. And it took only nine months to catalog the last 10 million elements. Again, it shows the exponential growth of technology. We are using computers in achieving all these tasks. And it shows the, this slide, yeah. In that uh, only number of chemicals, uh, is there any 
idea about how many are organic and how many are inorganic? Uh, I don't have that answer. I'm sure the database gives you the breakdown. Um, because another aspect of the database tells you how many 68 million proteins and DNA sequences are also there in that. So I apologize. I don't know the specific answer for that, but CAS will, will, will be able to figure that uh, if you want that answer. Uh, yeah, please feel free to stop and ask. We may extend a little bit, but I'm happy with, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. So this tells you the range of industries in which chemical uh, manufacturing uh, is uh, important from plastics, dyes, pigments. These are basic chemicals to specialty chemicals to agricultural products from a fertilizer. I'm going to spend some time on ammonia, which the BASO person also talked last week uh, uh, to food processing and uh, to pharmaceuticals, vaccines, vitamins, et cetera. Again, the rapid growth with which the vaccine was developed for COVID is an indication of how fast things are developing uh, in, in, in this space and consumer uh, chemicals. So it's a vast reach from the toothpaste that you use in the morning to uh, whatever you do at night, uh, the, the, chemical, the chemical engineering has some influence on what we do. So this slide essentially shows the most abundant, I mean, the most largest amount and largest energy consuming chemical that is produced is ammonia. So I will spend some time about history of ammonia as well. Okay, the next one is ethylene. You can understand why polyethylene plastics, even though that should go down, but ammonia saved and proved Malthus wrong. Okay, and that's because it is used as a raw material in fertilizer production. So it's a large volume and consumes large energy. So any efficiency that we can bring will improve uh, the uh, global warming effect, etc. And uh, just a brief history of chemical engineering. It didn't exist 200 years ago, and the first rudimentary form uh, started in 1792 in a coal technique in uh, uh, France, but Chemical engineering, as I said, it happen, uh, happens in the kitchen. So it has been happening for thousands of years. Wine making was there for thousands of years and uh, leather tanning and smelting. Uh, in, particularly in China and India, there's a long history of uh, extracting these uh, materials. But as a curriculum, it started in 1887 with George Davis. He was an in industrial inspector whose job it was to go to every plant and make sure that safety is obeyed. But what he saw was the same kind of unit was used in a sulfuric acid plant as in a nitric acid plant or as an ammonia plant. And uh, they didn't know about it because the training was through apprenticeship. If you want a job in sulfuric acid plant, you go and join a sulfuric acid plant, you know everything about it, but nothing about any other plant. And that synthesis of chemical engineering started occurring with his recognition that it's the same units that are used in different plants for the same purpose of reaction, mixing, separation. And of course, there are a few other equipment like changing the temperature, heat exchanger and pump pressures, changing the pressures. And then that led to in MIT, the formation of the first chemical engineering course in early 1900s and the same thing in Imperial College in, in England. And so 1900s is the first synthesizing moment for chemical engineering where unit operations was recognized as a synthesizing factor. So when you can train people on a distillation column or a separation column, whichever industry uses that, can employ them. So the training is made very, very efficient. Very soon within the next 20 years, hundreds of chemical engineering departments opened up in, uh, in the US. Similar trend happened in everywhere in the, around the world. That immediately poses the problem of quality control of education. So AACHE was formed in 1908 and they did the first accreditation of the chemical engineering program. But the next major uh, attempt of synthesizing occurred in the 1950s when mathematics was introduced into chemical engineering uh, as a synthesizing concept. What does that mean? If I'm writing down a conservation equation for a particular process, the mathematical form of it is the same, whether the process is distillation separation, absorption separation, extraction separation, et cetera. So all these different uh, operating units have the same underlying mathematical structure. 
Same thing with fluid mechanics, heat transfer, mass transfer. If you write down the transport equations, they look exactly the same, uh, except you replace the velocity with the temperature with concentration. The same set of algorithms, uh, solution methods can work. And that led to the development of computer simulators. Now you can uh, write a computer solution solver for these equations. And in 1980, uh, from MIT, first simulator was uh, introduced called Aspen. Computers started in, uh, impacting chemical engineering in bigger and bigger ways. And in 2000, a third revolution occurred, and it is continuing still, that is recognition that biochemical and biomolecular processes can also be subject to the same understanding that chemical engineers have had for purely organic or inorganic chemicals. These are separations, mixing, and reaction, right? What you call catalyst in the bio world, you call an enzyme, but essentially it is the same phenomena. And that uh, again started at MIT. And as I said, it is still continuing. So it expands the role of chemical engineers into health in other areas that deal with biological systems, uh, including bio uh, uh, energy. So this is this uh, very common diagram that we use, but you may not have seen something like this. This is called a process flow sheet. And essentially, if when you see a block like this, it is a unit operation. The first synthesis that I talked about. So here what happens is we want to uh, combine um, uh, nitrogen and hydrogen uh, to form ammonia. And that reaction releases a lot of heat. It's an exothermic reaction. But what you have is you take methane. You don't have hydrogen freely available in nature, right? So you take methane, which is one of the fossil uh, fuel material, or it could also be obtained from other sources. And through a reaction with water, you produce CO and hydrogen. Similarly, with uh, oxygen, you can produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And these are reactors because you are reacting two chemicals to produce a third chemical. And uh, that, that goes into another reactor and then a pump. Each one is a unit operation. And Aspen simulator, you can actually pull these icons, connect them and do a mass and energy flow calculation, simulation. And you have a scrubber which scrubs all the CO2 out by dissolving CO2 in water. So this is separation pulling the CO2 molecule from the mixture that comes here. So you feed only the nitrogen and hydrogen from here. Then this reaction occurs at a very high temperature and very high pressure. And the first innovation, in fact, there is a, a audio lecture by Professor M.M. Sharma from Mumbai uh, on the CCS article. You can listen to about 15 minutes of lecture by him on early innovations. He focuses on the ammonia production uh, the persons, the two people that uh, developed the cat catalyst for this reaction, Haber Bosch, were both Germans. They both won a Nobel Prize for their invention. And essentially, they developed the right catalyst and the right conditions, 450 degrees C and 300 bar, to produce ammonia from nitrogen to hydrogen. It's not a one-way reaction. It's a reversible reaction. So only 20% might convert. So you need to then separate them and recycle them. And this is a flow sheet for ammonia production. And this is how we communicate with students, with industry and others uh, to communicate what is happening. Oops. Uh, and this is how a real plant looks like. This is a very large scale equipment, a reactor, uh, first plant in 1913. And there comes the scale up problem because we want to achieve homogeneous condition, meaning Nitrogen and hydrogen should be in stoichiometric ratio at every point in your reactor. If you feed nitrogen from one side and hydrogen from the other side and hope them to mix, you may have a poor conversion, poor performance. And uh, the second, uh, these are the people. And here, what is interesting to notice is experimentation and observation with 5,000 different catalysts. They were systematically testing catalyst after catalyst to find out which catalyst works best. Okay, that's hard work. And there was no understanding. If you ask the question, why does this catalyst work better than the other? You have no answer. That answer had to wait till 2007 when another Nobel Prize was given to a chemist who understood and developed the mechanism for surface catalysis of a heterogeneous reaction system. And uh, this is uh, my comment on this. The Malthusian theory was proven wrong by technology. I am a technology enthusiast, okay? I think technology will solve all human problem. 
every past problem it will solve. It may create new problems, but it will also solve that problem in an exponentially increasing fashion. Okay, so he predicted the exponential population growth and arithmetic uh, uh, progression for the food growth, but with the fertilizer introduction into agriculture, exponential growth also occurred there. Okay, so this is a pause for transition to the next stage where I'm going to talk about computers and the role of computers. Okay, so here on the left, you see in 1980, what are the top 10 companies in the US? Okay, what do you see? Six of them are energy companies and two of them are automotives. There is an IBM there uh, and General Electric there. If you look at in 2020, what are the top companies? Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, you all know because they're all also in India, right? Uh, and there are three investment financial companies, but seven of them are tech companies, okay? So that shows the importance of technology that is driving the society's innovations and uh, improvement in productivity. Of course, these things are also being improved and innovated, uh, perhaps uh, at an increased pace compared to 1980, but still not as fast as uh, the other technology companies companies. Um, so this is the book by uh, Ray Kurzweil, Singularity is Near. The reason I like this book is he lays out a view that resonates with me. I hope it resonates with some of you. So he, he talks about how everything is built on physics and chemistry, the fundamental sciences that you are focusing on. So the first epoch is the information is contained in the atoms, physics and chemistry. Okay, and from that DNA evolves, he says. So the second epoch is of biology. Okay, somehow nature found out how to encode this information and pass it on from generation to generation in the DNA molecules. The third epoch is the information is contained in the brains. Okay, and uh, so the brain evolves. And then the fourth one is the brain creates a technology and the technology evolves. So the information now is stored in hardware and software in clouds and servers everywhere. We can instantly recall the answer to the question, how many of them are organic or inorganic molecules instantly, right? So the information is stored in those technologies. The next one he envisions is merger of human intelligence with machine intelligence. This is the era that we are experiencing now you students will fully experience in your lifetime what happens in the next 20, 25 years. And his last one is, we will be gone to explore the universe and the intelligence in the universe, etc. Uh, and he points this out by plotting in a graph of all the key elements in the evolutionary uh, ladder, okay? So what you see on the x-axis is time, before the present time, going from say 1000 years, 10,000 years, 100,000 years in a log scale. On the y axis, it's the time to the next event from life formation to uh, eukaryotic cells all the way down. If you go down, you'll see that there is a kind of a linear progression between the time for the next event and the current time. He plots the same thing on the linear scale to show what is the singularity, right? The rate of progress uh, that you see is accelerating at phenomenal stage. And that is what he calls a singularity. Singularity is near. Uh, and the, yeah, please, please. So this technology that I was just <laughs> thinking about, I mean, how do you define technology? I thought that technology is nothing but a probably smart implementation of the knowledge that you get from science or research. Yes, yes, absolutely. Of course, so this is basically the same thing, isn't it? The definition it is, yeah. Technology is implementation of knowledge that comes from science. Yeah. And, but it builds tools that accelerates that accumulation of knowledge. Yeah, so that's right? why I thought that it's the only smart way of implementing. Right, the right. So it is smart tool building, essentially smart tool building. Computers are nothing but tools, right? Okay. So we, the other possibility could be some trial and error. Which is exemplified by ammonia catalyst discovery. 5,000 catalysts, you try one after the other, that's a trial and error. But here we can use machine intelligence, we can solve problems much more effectively. And I'll show you some of the very fascinating recent developments. Uh, and probably I will also sit on the next lecture on AI, 
Um, but here, uh, Kurs uh, Ray Kurzweil plots uh, a trajectory that you see, okay? Uh, so he puts some of the actual events that occurred, the first uh, Univac and the first Apple II, and he projects from that this was done around 2011. And he says that the first computer that will have an intelligence better than a mouse will occur in 2015. Uh, that's a prediction, okay, uh, at this time. So for 2011 onwards is a prediction. And the next one he says is 2023, the first the artificial intelligence will be better than a human intelligence. I'm sure this will open up a lot of arguments because many of you may not agree with that. I interpret that as an average intelligence pitched against an average computer. We are almost there. We are almost there. The next year, I guess that is his prediction. But this is a more fascinating prediction for me. 2045, he says, the computer will be more intelligent than all brains put together in the universe, right? But that shows the acceleration pace and whether it will happen or not, the students will live to see, but they may not. But it's an interesting prediction to see. And basically- it's impossible. Hmm? I thought it's impossible because all this artificial intelligence or computers, they are built by human in many things. Right. So how can it be better than- <laughs> Well, that's a good question. How can something that we build be better than us? But the proof for that is in the games, chess, computer has beaten the best human player. Go, the computer has beaten the best. But still, I mean, probably, okay, maybe we can talk about it later. Yeah. I think that all the things that computer does, whatever we tell them to do, maybe in a way, somewhere or other. In a way that we don't understand. I will, I will talk about this in the next slide. Um, this is essentially showing the productivity increase over a period of time. Uh, essentially, humans have two limitations, muscle power and brain power. How much can we lift? How fast can we run? We overcame that muscle power when we started inventing engines, machines, okay? Machines gave us a way out of our muscle power limitation. And the thinking is AI will limit, uh, uh, relieve us from our limitations of the brain power, meaning that we will have a machine that is much more powerful in terms of its ability to process information and give us the information, we will still be working. The expectation is that we will still be working machine man in, uh, intelligence together to achieve things that we were not able to achieve so far. And so the productivity will continue to increase exponentially. This is not from Kurzweil, it is from somebody else, a computer scientist uh, that works in AI area, projects an exponential increase in productivity, whereas the machine intelligence period, the, the, uh, the machine one, uh, machine power, essentially gave us some increase in productivity, but not as phenomenal as we expect. Now, this essentially illustrates the framework for how this intelligence is going to be used. So Y equal to MX is a placeholder. You can put any complicated model, and we chemical engineers put very sophisticated uh, models there. But the idea that illustrates is, this is a slide from uh, uh, Google engineer, illustrates the process of learning, predicting and creating, sorts them out in nice ways, okay? So the first part is we take millions of images, that is why for you, and we have a label for each one of those and we train the machine, just like we train a child showing picture, this is a car, this is a flower, etc. So the child's brain absorbs this information. We don't understand how that happens, but the next day you show the child a car, it will predict that it is a car because it has learned, right? And so the first problem is learning, that is loading M, some neural network structure on your brain, uh, and this is how it is done. The second one is a recognition or the prediction problem where you ask for X as the unknown. M has been trained already, and you show a picture Y, and the child says it's a flower. The computer does this job with 95% accuracy. Where it has been tested is in reading the symbols for driving in the road, okay? Can a computer vision identify those symbols more accurately than human beings? The accuracy rate for human beings, which is used for uh, in car insurance uh, rating, et cetera, is around 87, 88%, a, com a computer vision does it at 95% accuracy, okay? So that's a prediction problem. The next one is the creation problem where we say, now give the child a crayon and say, draw a flower, okay? The child draws a flower, right? 
And uh, that problem is give the keyword, create the image. So X is given, you're going to create Y. And this is the picture that a computer at Google produced. It's a painting of a bird, okay? Uh, but this was about eight years ago, I think. And I'll show you the picture that present day computers can uh, show. So this is the most recent uh, open AI uh, product releases. They have released two products. One is called GPT-3, which is a language model. The other one is called DAL-E, which is uh, an image model. And it's interesting. Last night I sat, uh, sat at, the, at the computer and uh, the way it works is you give it a prompt. You start a sentence and it writes an essay for you. Okay. Here I said, okay, let me try this. Dr. Homi Baba was a great, I stopped there and it took with that and it wrote the rest of it. Okay. You can analyze it for grammatical. You can analyze it for technical content. You can find fault also in this. What are the fault is? I don't think he was a Bengali. I think he was a Farsi, right? <laughs> 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 but um, to its credit, I should say that this was produced by, this is the range of language models that OpenAI has released. It was used with this model, okay? That, that has about 6 billion parameters, 6 billion neurons. Okay. It was trained with lots of data, but with 6 billion parameters. But the most accurate one is called GPT-3, it's not publicly available yet, and that uses 175 billion neurons. This is a massive computational problem because you're feeding it terabytes and terabytes of data. Everything Shakespeare has written, everything that is in Wikipedia, everything that is in all the published articles. You feed that and uh, it has learned. What is this learned? mean? I don't know. But if it can write that essay, and the next version can write even better essay, is there, a, can you tell a difference whether it was written by a human being or a machine? That's a Turing test for you, right? So, <laughs> um, but uh, the smaller versions are publicly available. I can give you the link where you can go and play with this. If you enter the same phrase the second time, it will spin a different story, right? <laughs> Each time it will write a different essay, right? Um, humans are estimated to have a, about 86 billion neurons or 100 billion neurons. So we're almost there. Human com uh, capacity in terms of learning is almost there, but it's a huge computational problem, but you need to do it only once. Once you have the parameters, you can easily copy and replicate, okay? Um, this is where it gets even more interesting for creativity. This is a pro program uh, released uh, for demonstration purpose. It's not available yet for us. It's called Dali. I know, I'm sure you're all familiar with Salvador Dali he was a painter. And uh, you also know Pixar's movie, Wally, right? So it's a play on those two words called Dali too. And what you do is you give it a text prompt and it takes the text prompt and creates a painting for you. Okay, so here what you see there's um, a bowl of soup that is a portal to another dimension as a digital art. That's the keyword you specify, and this is the picture that it creates a bowl of soup with a portal, right? Now you can go to that site and pick, click on the different set. So it's only a demo, it's not available for us to play with yet. It's only a demo. And you can click on other combinations and this picture will change. It'll automatically create the picture for you, a new picture for you. That picture doesn't exist anywhere, okay? Is that intelligence or not? I don't know, is that creativity or not, right? So it really opens up very interesting questions in my mind. Now, uh, talking about innovation, uh, this is a uh, definition that the CTO of Dow Chemicals came up with. Okay, so invention is something that you make that doesn't exist. Innovation is something that you incrementally improve on existing things. Okay, so I give you an example of uh, innovation and invention uh, in three areas, automotive, Model T to a modern Porsche. This is a phenomenally powerful car compared to a Model T. But this has been achieved through every year in fuel efficiency, 3% drag reduction here, there, through engineering ingenuity, you go from this to this. Same thing, a Wright Brothers plane to a modern Dreamliner. 
Same thing from an ENIAC computer, a room full of diode-based uh, computers that can do 100 floating points perhaps per second to one that is million times smaller and million times faster achieved through innovation over a period of time, sustained innovation. Now, if you ask what is the situation in uh, chemical industry, unfortunately, it is not as rapid. And that is my interest. I want to understand why that is and how we can make that happen. Okay, so this is uh, what is called a distillation column in the 1940s. It's the same thing in 2016. Okay, it's a very, very, very slow process to innovate in the chemical industry for process, not for chemicals. Molecules, we are spinning out one at every two, 2.6 seconds, right? So uh, it's only for the process of how we, and not all those 100 million molecules are produced in large quantities. Only 10,000 are produced in large quantities. And this is the picture that I borrowed from uh, Dieter uh, from BASF that shows uh, that the distillation column that you see here, this is an insert that I put in. What is happening inside that distillation column? The distillation column pulls the molecules apart. It's a separation device. But what happens is you have a vapor that goes up, up and a liquid that comes across. There are several stages in this column and it's a very complex multi-phase flow. And that is the reason why we cannot simulate and design using purely theoretical approaches. We need practical experimental approaches as well. And this is the size of a typical tray inside such a column. You can see compared to a man, it could be 15 feet, 20 feet in diameter. So the liquid comes down, flows across, overflows to the next tray, and the gas or vapors are bubbling through that. What is it governed by? It is governed by uh, this equation that you're all familiar with, physicists, chemists. It's Newton's law of motion for fluids. It's a Navier-Stokes equation. Yet, if you can prove that the solution exists for this, you get a million dollars. It's a million in problem, right? We don't know whether solution exists for this uh, differential equation. But as a practical engineer, we say, we'll go ahead and solve it anyway with a computer. Again, computers come as a handy, and this is a CFD, computational fluid dynamics, which is my area of uh, interest in terms of uh, solving uh, these equations. And here you'll understand why it is so difficult. Okay, here is the liquid dropping from the tray above and the vapor going from here, but the liquid flow down is too large. It's like weeping, okay? So instead of separating, you are mixing it. In this stage, the vapor flow rate is so high, it is carrying the liquid as droplets to the tray above, once again, mixing. What we ideally want is good mixing between the vapor and the liquid and the separation so that the vapor goes its way and the liquid comes down. Uh, uh, to the next ray. These are the kinds of equipment that we chemical engineers use, okay? This is called a bubble column, a fluidized bed. Each one of them has multi-phase mixtures, a solid in a liquid or a bubble in a liquid or gas and solid, etc. They are used for different purposes, as I said, for separation, for reaction, for mixing, okay? And uh, our job is to develop very high fidelity models so that using computers alone, we can design these equipment in a very systematic manner. Uh, this is how traditionally people design. So they do experiments, they gather the data, they put them in dimensionless form in the idea that if they keep the ratios of the forces the same, whether it's a small column or a large column, the performance should be the same. It is not true, but this is how they have been building for the last hundred years. And so they need to test on different scales as they scale up. And why is it not true? Because if the experimental scale is small, then the largest vortices that I can form, the mixing, the circulation that I form is limited by the size of the equipment. As I build bigger and bigger equipment, these vortices are bigger. And so it creates dispersion at a larger scale. And so the performance is not the same as you would expect from the laboratory scale. So this slide needs uh, probably 30 minutes to explain in great detail. Uh, so I will just move on to say that this is the problem. As you increase the size, the nature of the flow inside the vessel changes, and so we lose the ability to predict them. This is an example of, um, I hope it will play, mixing, a brute force mixing, where I'm mixing two different colors, and I want to achieve a homogeneous color. These could be two different chemicals, and I'm mixing by putting energy from oscillating a cylinder at the bottom. So very, crude way of mixing. And I will show you, this is mixing by beating it with so a stirrer, a gas and a liquid. And I will show you the next one where the mixing is done 
by two different pipes, each carry one liquid, but they come together only at the end and then they mix. So you see the homogeneity is maintained at all scales, whereas in the previous case, the scales were very different. This is what happens in human body. This is why chemical engineers can relate to what is happening in the human body. These are called fractal structures. So based on that, we have designed some of the fractal distributors. We are thinking about fractal uh, stirrers, etc. cetera. Uh, hopefully with uh, Professor uh, Shankar's uh, help, we can start doing some of those things because I'm really fascinated by his it's experimental skills. The parameters that you require for, for example, mixing also. I mean, there are many things which are involved because this chemical process is a very slow process. I have a feeling that that's one of the limitations. Some of them are slow, some of them are very fast. So you need to measure the kinetics of the reaction where we rely on chemists to come and tell us what is the, uh, how fast is the reaction going on. And we need to manage our supply in such a way that the time scale for inlet and exit in the reactor matches with the reaction time scale. That we can do. As chemical engineers, we can do that. So this is what we really want to do. A plant that is scattered like this with pumps and stuff, we want to modularize it. One of the advantages of modularizing it is if one small piece is old, there is a newer version of it, we can just throw it and plug in. But you cannot throw an entire distillation column because that's a huge multi-million dollar investment. Why did computers achieve such a rapid rate? Because everything is in modular. If you have a disk that fail, I can throw the disk and buy the latest version of the new disk SSD. I cannot do that in a chemical plant. So I need to make it in such a way that it is modular. That will give me the rapidity with uh, innovation cycle that uh, I would like to achieve. And uh, I think I'm going to skip some of these slides. This is the slide again that needs a minutes to explain because it tries to integrate from molecular scale all the way to the equipment scale. Currently, the simulation is done thanks to Aspen that came out in 1980 or at the plant scale. But we want to improve the performance of individual equipment. We want to peek inside what happens in the equipment. And as I said, these things occur at the molecular level, whether it is mixing or separation or reaction. So we need to build our models using molecular dynamic simulation, density functional theory, whatever information that comes from that in terms of the kinetics, for example, how fast a reaction is taking place, build that and then look at the advection, mixing, et cetera, on the next scale and uh, couple that with data enabled modeling to improve our parameters that go into these models. And I'm just going to show you uh, a few examples. Uh, yeah, this is just a warning that all models are wrong, some models are useful, right? And uh, we have to be aware that the models that we use have limitations uh, in terms of the parameterization uh, that we use. So this is our logo for EPIC. I run a center called Enabling Process Innovation Through Computation with EPIC as the logo, okay? Essentially, the foundational base is the science of multi-phase, multi-physics, uh, multi-scale processes, and then the enabling technologies or advanced measurements and advanced simulation techniques, and then the creativity of designing these separations, mixing reaction. Uh, and that technology can be applied for any one of the processes, whether you're producing cosmetic or uh, petrochemicals or uh, uh, in, in food, whatever it is, to produce uh, engineered products. So the knowledge, as you pointed out, knowledge from the science base transferred into technology in the most efficient manner. So this is a modularization that I talked about earlier. And this is the biomimicry, which should play an increasingly important role in the future. What, because the human body is a wonderful machine of mixing separation reaction. Okay? We get our energy by taking the food and reacting it. Uh, to produce the energy. And uh, at the lung, for example, we exchange, we separate the oxygen and the carbon dioxide and exchange across membranes, etc. So it's a very finely evolved machine. There's a lot that we can learn by looking at what happens. So two examples. The first example is polyethylene manufacturer. One of the companies came to us and showed this graph, which is essentially the pressure fluctuation in their pump. Uh, and because of that, they cannot increase their productivity. The pump will fail. So they said, can you use your CFD to tell us why this is happening and solve the problem? 
So how did we do? We, this is a loop reactor. This is the reactor that they are using. So they put ethylene in here, put some catalyst, and let it go in cycles. And it polymerizes, forms polyethylene pellets, and they withdraw the polyethylene pellets. But these pellets aggregate for some time in some instances. And then what you will see, you watch the pressure drop calculation here. As this moves up, it's going against gravity. It's a heavier uh, particle than the liquid in which it is suspended. So you will see that the pressure goes up. And then when it comes down, the pressure goes down. And when it hits the pump, the pump is here, you get a big cycle. So this cycle is <coughs> persistent because of the presence of these slugs. So the question is, how can we get rid of the slugs? So we did some simulations to show that in concept, if you take a lot of particles and put them around a bend, when they come out of the bend, they are all aligned in one side because of the centrifugal force as it goes through. Simulation can predict that. Then we said, okay, this is a real loop reactor with eight loops and each one is 50 meters tall and 0.5 meters in diameter. <clears throat> and there is a pump here, just one pump cycling it through. So we said, as it comes out of the band, we know that they, they are segregated. They are like this. So we're going to put some veins and have a metric of how uniform the concentration is at any plane that you take as you go away from the bend. And this is the type of range that we came up with. And we did six simulations, one with six veins, four veins, and two veins. And you will watch as the animation goes, how the swirl created by these veins causes the composition of the particles to be uniform. We want it to be perfectly monocolor in a sense. But here you see the centrifugal force is so large, the particle concentration outside is higher than in the inside. In the next one, with only four veins, we are giving a weaker uh, swirl. <laughs> and in the last one, you will see the best result. So we gave them as the solution. Okay, so you could go and rip apart your reactor, put these veins and put them back, and that will fix their problem. We gave them another solution as well, which is what they uh, actually adopted. I'm but sorry, can you please explain what, what has been done in this case? Uh, I'm giving, I'm putting some veins that are twisted. And those veins create a swirl. As the liquid comes, it creates a swirl. As it swirls, the particles are thrown out radially. But if the swirl is too strong, then the particles go to the outside like this. From one side, they go to the outside. Is it necessary that this has to be kept vertical? That's their design. That's what they have. Your, your point is good. Why does it have to be vertical? Can it be horizontal? Then the gravity uh, effect can be taken care of. The, uh, the, the settling will be there, the sedimentation will be there, but the velocities here are very high, seven meters per second. So the probably settling is not going to be a problem. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I don't know the history of, this is where at the design stage, you have so many degrees of freedom, right? Why did they choose it to be vertical and not horizontal? Nobody knows. Now, present day, if I were doing this design, I would do a simulation for horizontal, do a simulation for vertical and tell them which is better, right? But that doesn't happen. You just dispense with all the degrees of freedom in an ad hoc random manner initially. Which software do you use for this simulation? Uh, ANSYS. ANSYS, ANSYS Fluent, yeah. So this was the pressure variation before and after. After you put the veins, this is the pressure variation. So they could make $20 million more per year if they make this change because a 2%, 3% increase in the productivity means a lot of money for them. <clears throat> uh, I guess I'll take five more minutes uh, with uh, my last example. This is about fractals. I think you are probably all familiar with what fractals are. These are spatially self-similar structures that once again, you find in nature, as I said, in uh, lung, but also in broccoli and other places. But the geometrical thing was discovered by Mandelbrot, a mathematician. Once again, mathematician, physicist, chemist, feeding us ideas, right? And we just thrive on them. <clears throat> so these are all examples of fractal structures that you find in nature. But what is the problem that we are faced with? This is called a distributor that distributes a liquid from the top of a tower, okay? And you pump the liquid through this, you branch it like this, and then you branch it further, and these are the taps through which the liquid will drip. It's like a shower, right? But what happens is the, the dripping rate from this point is much lower than the dripping rate from this point. Why is that? Because there is a pressure drop as it goes through, and the pressure here is higher than the pressure there because there is an additional pressure drop as it goes through. 
So only over a very narrow range of pressure, you can achieve fairly uniform distribution. If you cut down the flow rate, the outer ones will stop feeding you. And so you get maldistribution, you get poor performance of the equipment. So this is a fractal distributor. Okay, what does this have as a feature? The distance between the entrance point and any one of the exit point is identical. You might be surprised by this. You might say, well, this seems to be very close to this compared to this with here. But what you need to do is trace along the path. To get to this point, you need to go here, come down, go down, go down, and come back. And you do the same thing to the other point, the distance will be exactly the same. So it preserves the scale symmetry, if you like, the sure direction you go, it's a two dimensional plane that you get the same resistance and hopefully you should get the same flow rate. And does that happen? These are all the industrial uses of fractal distributors. <coughs> we, what we did was an ion exchange uh, device that one of the sugar companies was using in the US. And uh, <coughs> so we put a PhD student into it so he came up with this, what is called plate and frame design. Essentially what you have is a number of plates. These plates were made of plexiglass. I will show you the construction, but initially this is a demonstration of not fixing a problem that already exists, like in the retrofitting of the polyethylene plant. This is a new design. So we are free to dream up any design that we want. And uh, so we said that we are going to take one inlet and split it into four. And these four will be matched with the center of these four on the other side. And that will feed into, each one will feed into four, that makes it into 16, and that makes it into 64, et cetera. Each plate will then double in size. And the goal is as it comes out of the last plate, the flow rate should be as uniform as possible. Because you made the distances the same, the resistance the same, it should be uh, expected, okay? And, <clears throat> Here is his uh, 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 animation to show both sides of how he did it in, uh, again, computer uh, CAD program called SolidWorks, uh, where he designed it from his mind and then sent it off for fabrication and then got it built and then tested it. <clears throat> so this is his test rig where we want to see how uniform the flow rate is. And uh, uh, I will skip this experiment because this is his uh, dye injection that shows but the animation from the computer shows it better, I think. So this is what we measure as a residence time distribution. Residence time distribution says, how long did the molecule reside in its path from inlet to outlet? If the residence time distribution is a spike, that means all of them had the same history. But typically because of the curves and bends, you have a broad distribution, meaning different molecules spend different lengths of time. And our goal is to make it as narrow as possible. The residence time should be, should be as narrow as possible. So with 256 outlets, he is getting a narrowing tend. With 16, it is much broader. So he just takes one plate out and you can add one more plate, et cetera, to play with this. But the more interesting thing is, well, this is an animation that shows the dividing process. And what you will see is as it comes out, you want a very flat front as it goes through that. This is where you keep the adsorbent. Okay, the, for chromatography, et cetera. And he designed this expanding cone so that it doesn't come as a jet. That again was done before we fabricated it because he tested different things in silico using just computer simulation. And we are very happy with this uh, thing. And then so we went and built it. But the student was very cautious. He calculated what is the flow rate from every one of those outlets. And he found that there is a 7% variation in the flow rate, okay? And the question is why, can I do better? And the answer to that was when he plotted the velocity profile, he saw that there is a vortex as you bend. This was a decision, design decision without a lot of thinking, right? He just took one, bent it like this. And then of course, fractal geometry decides everything else, but there is a separation. And so the liquid that goes to the left side is not the same as the liquid flow that goes to the right side, the amount. So there is a small variation, 2%, 3% variation that propagates further down. So he said, okay, I'm going to look at this parameter. I'm going to make the cross section as kind of a vertical rectangle or a horizontal rectangle. And I can ask you the question, can you think which one will do better? Right? And uh, the answer comes from the simulation, even if your intuition is not well developed. And answer, and he developed this, uh, what he call response service diagram, which says if you any design, the combination of velocity and aspect ratio in this region will give you a small coefficient of uh, variation. 
And so avoid that design domain. But what is interesting is with the broad one, you see a large vortex and a difference in the flow rate as it splits at the next point. With a smaller cross section, by the time it reaches that, it becomes straight. And so the splitting is even. So this gives you much better even distribution through all the outlets than one with a broader channel width. And these are all done, as I said, in silico before we did the uh, design. Is and we can- really in, uh, I mean, the, all the tastes are in water or what, what is oh, uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, uh, the simulations were done with water as the working fluid. The viscosity might uh, be low. It can, and if that is the case, you just do the simulation again with the new viscosity. You don't need to- we use that as a parameter. We use that as a parameter. It appears in the Navier-Stokes equation as a parameter. So you just change the uh, fluid. <clears throat> so this is the actual fractal <coughs> geometry we built for a bubble column, which is a different device to show how uniform bubbles we can generate from such a column. And uh, this is essentially our ranking of the knowledge uh, at present of how well we can do for various flow situations. I think I won't go into that. So just concluding remarks, the flow variation inside process vessels, which include multiphase flow, is hardly homogeneous. It's highly heterogeneous, to, uh, in fact. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> we don't need to know where every bubble is, every particle is. We can smooth things out and solve the so-called interpenetrating continuum model. And uh, our goal is to cut down the time to develop a new technology so that we can deploy new technologies very quickly. And in order to do that, we also have to include a modular design process so that one part can be replaced with another uh, improved part, for example. Uh, <clears throat> these are all the problems that I have worked on. If any of them pick your interest, we can spend time together discussing this. Uh, they range, I'm, I'm a collaborator by nature. So I seek out experimentalists and I'm a modeler. So we work together. So we have worked on uh, polymer processing, oil sands. Uh, I'm working with the Professor Shankar on the granular flow, microfluidics, et cetera. Um, but I want to leave you with the last slide, opportunities for India. This is a feel good slide. <laughs> the first slide, I don't know how many of you have seen this? You have not seen this? This is, came in the econ Economist essentially shows the GDP of all countries in the world over 2000 years, okay? Starting from 2000 years ago to the present time. And what you see here is India and China. In fact, India is bigger than China. 2000 years ago, in terms of the GDP, they had 60% of the world's GDP, the two countries put together, okay? And that persisted till about 1700s. And then, of course, you know what happened, right? So the productivity just came down. It was sucked out of us, in a sense, right? And now it's picking back up. And China is going twice as fast as, or maybe more than twice as fast as India. But the hope is there that we can, that is, this is our natural state, I would argue, right? And what happened in the 200 years was unnatural, and we should go back. And it is in your hands, as young students, it is in your hands to bring that innovation and to bring that courage to continue to uh, uh, enhance the GDP of the country. Is it US started doing badly recently? Because the no, US is still strong. Yeah, uh, but it has reduced that the previous, like seven. Yes, years. yes, uh, that is uh, established. China's uh, GDP is growing at a faster rate and that is coming at the expense of uh, US, yeah. <laughs> And uh, what do we need to do? We are the software providers for the whole world, but software as a service, we do for banking industry, we do for uh, every other industry. We should evolve from that to say, develop the next generation of computational tools, the AI engines, the, the uh, physics-based simulators, whether it is computational chemistry or computational biology, or computational transport phenomena, which is kind of my area, right? And development of hardware. I, I go to China often and I see their uh, investment in hardware, CPU design. They have some of the best CPUs uh, right now. Four years ago, I went and they showed me an HPC, uh, which was a water-cooled CPU that was designed by them. And last yesterday, you might have, some of you might have read, which country has the fastest computer today? US. That changed yesterday, right? US has the fastest computer in Lasalamos lab or something like that. It is a chip that is designed by 
Dell, I think, water cooled, Dell or HP, water cooled CPU. Five years behind, but it's a massive computer compared to, but this year, China did in, not even put in a competition. And the speculation in the news article is they don't want to again come on first because US will get angry and impose more sanctions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So um, if they know that they are number one, they are happy with it. But we need to invest. I don't know what is happening in India, but we need to invest in hardware development. Because That's the one thing where I think we are lacking very badly. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Because if India evolves rapidly in other areas, that's where US will crush India, right? Because they are doing it to Huawei in China. Why would they not do it to any other country? And uh, I, I, this is a suggestion for TFIR, uh, applied computational science research center. Here I'm envisioning a computational chemistry, computational biology, computational transport phenomena. We have a very strong computational science program, but an applied computing science program that focuses on the core algorithm development, the next generation core algorithm development, that would be fantastic. And uh, promote industry academia collaboration, which I think Dieter also talked about. Uh, this is happening a lot in the US, in Europe, et cetera. That, that should happen more. I hope uh, that happens. ERCs, engineering research centers in the US is funded by NSF. So maybe DST should take an initiative and throw some money to catalyze, crystallize those kinds of interactions. And he talked about, that. Uh, Dieter talked about what does this do? It takes ideas at technical readiness level. TRL is standing for technical readiness level three to seven. They call this is the valley of death. A lot of ideas are developed from fundamental sciences, but they don't cross to go into commercialization because there's a huge investment that is needed to work out all the technological problems. Okay, And so I think uh, that, that might help. And then entrepreneur tra uh, training for students and the faculty. China does this very well. If you have a patent, China will give you a big lump sum money for every patent that you have or every nature paper that you have. And so they're producing a lot of nature papers and patents, right? So something like this at the governmental level might, might help India compete better with China. So I will stop there. I think I have taken five, one hour, three minutes. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Educational facility that we're talking about. I mean, how powerful uh, high performance computing? I mean, power is required for such kind of initiative. Um, I mean, it's a, uh, they call it a hexascale computation, right? So, uh, no, so many. You have says, I'm mean, talking about the point two that you mentioned. Oh, the Applied Computational Science Research Center? Yeah. That, that, that would be, you can achieve that within your framework if you strategically hire and say, I'm going to have a research center that focuses on the applied side, but that focuses on bringing the computational chemists. They can be still part of chemistry department. The others could be part of the biology department. But there are a lot. I understand. Yeah. I'm just wondering that. But, okay. Oh, computing yeah. power. Infrastructure support, like uh, oh, I see. Uh, that that um, I hear that you have some of the best computing facilities in the country, and Institute of Science apparently has uh, also very similar facilities. But you can build that, I think. Yes, yeah. I have a question, uh, Professor Nandakumar Jyotishman. This is Jyotishman. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, very nice talk. Um, I just wanted to uh, get this this particular chart that you have. Um, so, uh, what was the basis for these numbers that they have given? This seems like they're, they're yeah, yeah. put out of thin air. How did they get that at thousand AD? What was what were the numbers and was it was there an estimate? A historical estimate of you know, obviously there was no record keeping uh, that right. many years right so it is obviously an estimate and uh, it's not my numbers the source is given there uh, it appeared in the economist and uh, i've seen that uh, used many times uh, to show the rapid growth in india and uh, china in the last 40 years uh, so I'm not an economist, so I don't know how one would even estimate these numbers, right? Okay, okay. And they also say that it is purchasing power parity, right? Okay. So to come up with um, these numbers 2,000 years ago, uh, 
is going to be a lot of lot of uh, estimation. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Good question for which I have no good answer. <laughs> Sorry. Anybody else? Students? Maybe I can ask another question. Can I ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please, please. Okay. Too much, I think. I'm just trying to draw the students into the conversation. <laughs> thinking like uh, for example this uh, chemical process that you are talking about like separation mixing and like, cooking together so, so are you also i mean thinking of using this factor structure for beta mixing and mm -hmm. beta efficiency or something like that right right so then the size can be also controlled right the size of the plant and uh, and it can be also much modularized, etc. A lot of those things are possible. And in fact, uh, I think uh, when I was talking to Shankar, he was talking about quad coppers uh, collaborating with each other. And this idea has been in my mind for a while. It's it's it's, it's drawn from videos I've seen about quad coppers. Quad coppers are just <clears throat> mixing stirrers for me. So if I can put them, immerse them in a tank mm -hmm. at different location. Right, and then I can look. The other thing is the IoT, the Internet of Things. The sensors are so cheap; we can put sensors everywhere and get the local velocity. And I can supply more power to one small propeller here or another one there to homogenize. My goal is to homogenize the whole thing as much as possible to give every molecule the same experience, the same residence time. How do I homogenize the flow? If you look at, I can show you a lot of uh, uh, experimental visualization and simulation results in large tanks with stirrers. Mm -hmm. You will see big, large vortices and there's no, no action in some other areas, right? And so there are tremendous opportunities if we can throw away what we have been doing and think afresh mm -hmm. in the digital world. And that's possible these days. Are there any simulation packages which are also using AI, like ANSYS and all the other? They are all claiming that they can do uh, design innovation, which is not directly through AI, but you set a set of parameters and uh, it will automatically search that parameter space for the optimum design. So you give a metric of this is my objective function I want to optimize. And it will systematically change the length, the diameter, the height, the location, do hundreds of simulation and produce a response curve that I showed you, for example, in that case. And that says in this parameter range, you have a local minima or local maxima, or whatever the optimization is. We just finished, one of my students just finished a, a thesis on shape optimization, catalyst shape optimization. It was attained to ethylene conversion and typically we just use spherical droplets or a cylindrical catalyst, right? Why? Because that's what we've been doing all the time, right? So we said, we are going to look at how can we change the shape so that the temperature variation inside the catalyst is minimized as much as possible. Because if you create a hot spot, then you destroy the catalyst activity and it creates other problems. So you operate the entire reactor at a lower temperature, not in order to avoid the hotspot formation. But hopefully with the optimized design, we can say reasonably the temperature is uniform inside. So those things are becoming possible. But the AI, the kind of that you see in uh, GPT-3 or DALI hasn't entered yet. Those are very new results at the, what they call low hanging fruits, right? The language model. Uh, in English has been done. But once you know it in English, you can do it in any other language. And then they can do the translation for you. We won't understand how it does, but it will do a good job of translation, right? So uh, translation already is pretty good. Character recognition, those were all done long time ago. So as I said, I'm an eternal optimist for technology. So, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so that uh, getting uniform flow rate problem, uh, you showed a graph where uh, the aspect ratio and uh, versus the uh, chlorate. Right? Yeah. So I think that the uh, viscosity there plays a big role. Right? Yes, yes. As he pointed out, in that graph, viscosity will play a role. But we, we would, we should have presented it as a function of Reynolds number, right? It's a viscosity and inertia that ratio that plays an important role. Yeah. Very wide. Yeah. Uh, wide yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So then the, vis the role of viscosity is very small. So yeah. It will be covered hopefully by gravity. Right. There's a lot of 
Yeah, the vertices don't form if the Reynolds number is five or ten, right? So it's should, should, should not that uh, viscosity be included in that graph. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should have plotted it as a Reynolds number, then viscosity would be included. Instead of flow rate, Reynolds number has both the flow rate, the velocity, and the viscosity ratio. The inertial forces to viscous forces ratio is what we call Reynolds number, right? And if I had plotted on that, then it would have been more generally useful. Yeah, correct. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you can, you can all <laughs> proceed for snacks. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm? You can have snacks at your home also. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nandakumar, for the lovely okay. collection. Thank you. Thank you for this.